Eliore here. How are you doing? So, um, this week, oh shoot, there's my heater. Uh, sorry about the sound in the background. Um, this week was um, my fourth testosterone shot and um, my dosage went up and um, next week I'll be taking double the dose that I took for the first three weeks. So, yay. Um, making some progress there, even though I don't feel like I'm making any other kind of progress. I mean, I got a haircut, and um, yeah, today I, today? Yesterday. Yesterday, I dyed my hair purple again. I used to have my hair purple all the time, so I figured I'd dye just the top of it and see if I like it like this, which I do for now. I don't know. I'll stick with it for a while. Um, I don't know when, uh, when I'll get to the point where I'm like, I'm too old to be dyeing my hair purple, but, you know, I'm a hacker, so I can get away with purple hair for a while, right? I don't know, maybe. Anyway, um, so I wanted to make today's video about, um, about masculinity. So obviously, obviously, this is something I've been thinking about for a long time. Um, and I'm sure that there will be many other videos that I make in the future uh, about some topic about masculinity. Um, but in addition to some of the thoughts that I was having about what I wanted to talk about in my video this week, I also uh, saw an old video from Electric Dade that's titled Masculinity, Choosing the Man That You Want to Become. I'll put a link to that down in the... Um, thingies down in the description um, and maybe there will be a link up here maybe um, or maybe I just pointed at nothing uh, anyway uh, the stuff that Dade was saying is along the lines of some of the things that I have been thinking about masculinity uh, but sort of from a slightly different angle so, for my whole life, I've always sort of seen myself as a very boyish girl or a very kind of masculine woman. I always found it weird when people on the outside of me would say that they didn't see me as masculine, but uh, people who knew me well would often tease me about certain aspects of my personality that are, uh, you know, a problem of toxic masculinity. Things like, um, you know, pain. I will go through all kinds of pain. Be like, err, tough guy, no, no, I'm tough. I don't need to do anything about this. Let's keep going. Um, I once, back when I was an ice skating coach, I dislocated my kneecap um, when I tripped over my own feet while jumping out of the way to try not to squish a small skater that was in front of me while I was I was looking back at one of my skaters that was getting ready to do a jump and I noticed out of the corner of my eye that there was a small person right here so I jumped out of the way and kind of tripped and when I fell I fell while I was turning so I literally just like moved my kneecap over. Um, I got back up and I kept teaching for another two hours before I went to the emergency room. That's the kind of stuff that, uh, that I have been known to do. That was probably not the smartest move I ever made. Uh, also not smart was like two weeks later while I was still, um, in a cast, I got back on the ice in a cast. Um, it seemed logical at the time. Uh, it was just too difficult to teach from the side of the ice. Anyway, um, that's probably the least problematic of my tendencies. Uh, Dade talks about talking too loud and taking up too much space. Both of these things are things that I do. Now, I talk loud not only to get attention, but also because 
Um, I have a father who's hard of hearing, who spent most of my life until I was in my late 30s, maybe even my early 40s, um, denying that he was hard of hearing and complaining all of the time that everybody around him just mumbled too much. And so I was constantly told to speak up and to enunciate clearly. The enunciation has been very good for me because it helps me uh, teach people who do not have English as a first language and it makes me easy for them to understand. And apparently it also means that I have a good radio voice uh, when I'm doing ham work. So yay my dad for making me speak up and enunciate clearly. Uh, but boo, uh, because of an, a lifetime of being told that I speak too quietly by my father, I actually speak way too loudly for everybody else and get a lot of criticism for how loud I am. Um, and I have noticed over the years that I've really tried to work because I've been aware of this problem probably for about 20 years now uh, in myself, uh, like really aware of it. I think people said stuff about it when I was a teenager, but I thought that they were just being jerks. Um, but since my 20s, I realized that it really was a real problem. And, um, and I've worked at it. But especially when I get into business meetings and things like that, I will raise my voice in order to be heard um, and kind of, you know, metaphorically elbow my way into a table to try to get people to take me seriously. Uh, the taking up too much space, one of the things that I think is funny, took me the longest time to understand the meme about man spreading. Uh, and it finally dawned on me one day, a long time ago now, thank goodness, but it, it dawned on me one day, some years ago, that the reason that I didn't understand the whole meme about manspreading was because that's what I do when I sit down. I am not, I have never been the woman that like sits with her knees pressed together or cross, legs crossed or, you know, knees off to the side. When I have been in certain kinds of formal situations where that was required, um, I would I would perform that form of mass of femininity uh, in order to fit in, but I had to work really hard to perform that particular role. When I was just relaxed and just being me, I'm just like champion man spreader. <laughs> uh, yeah, and one of one of the reasons, one of the one of the things that has been in my mind for years now as I've as I've thought about transitioning and why I should or shouldn't transition, one of the issues is an, an issue of feminism. Um now I do not want to get give any oxygen to the turfs. Uh, and this is not meant to give any weight to any kind of stupid thing that uh, trans exclusionary anybody's might say. But in my own personal thought processes, I was concerned about the fact that um, there is a need for other forms of femininity to be visible and to exist and um, to break down some of those ideas about what it means to be a woman and what it means to be feminine and that some of my mannerisms that are more masculine that by claiming them as a woman that I was doing something an activity that was feminist and I do feel a little bit bad, or I did. I don't think I do now. Um, nearly a month into this transition, I'm feeling much different about it. But um, uh, leading up to this, it was one of my concerns that, um, yeah, do I, do I need to be a man 
for myself? Is that somehow selfish when um, claiming this space as as a form of femininity can also be a, a stance for feminism. Now, I'll tell you what I've come to on that front, and that is that um, while there are maybe other women who can hold that space, uh, I held it for 49 years and I don't have to anymore. Um, in fact, I didn't have to do it for 49 years, uh, and there is some cost to me that I have given up by holding that space for 49 years that in some ways was not my space to hold. And now, as a man, I can support those women who feel good in their female body, feel good as women, to be whatever the heck it means to them to be a woman and to express their femininity, their womanhood in whatever they want, whatever way they want, and that it is in some ways more radically feminist for me to fully embody myself as a man in the body, the shape, the, the experience that I want to live my life and to do it in a way that supports women, other people being fully who they want to be. Um, anyway, so one of the conversations that I had actually with a uh, an intersex rabbi that I spoke to before making my final decision. I really wanted their input on several different subjects, including, you know, what it means to be trans or intersex within Jewish practice. I had read things, but reading things isn't the same thing as talking to somebody who has direct lived experience of not fitting into the binary as well as community connections with trans people who are living their life. Um, and one of the things that Amashe said to me, um, Rabbi Amashe said that, um, you know, maybe if you uh, lean into masculinity and explore masculinity, you won't feel the need to express masculinity in these toxic ways. You'll be more comfortable and knowing what you know will be more able to embody a more healthy masculinity. And wow, I sat with that for a bit and realized that that was a deep truth for me, for me personally, that, um, being able to be perceived as male and to exist and move around in the world as a man means that I can actually spend some of that energy to focus on what it means to um, contract and give space to other people, what it means to contract and, and give space to women or, or support, even not contracting, but supporting women in who they are. Let me also say, when I say contract, I don't mean lessen myself. What I mean is, you know, I don't have to take up all the room. I don't have to take up all of the air just to be heard or seen, because by default, people who are perceived as masculine are going to be seen more in the types of contexts that I was uh, filling up. So um, I am looking forward to seeing how I progress in the future and develop as, as a human being, um, both leaning into 
what it means to be masculine um, in a in a social sense, in a spiritual sense, in a personal sense, but also seeing what that means to be um, radically feminist. Don't don't let the turfs take the term radical feminism. They're not the radical feminists. Um, what does it mean to be a man who is radically feminist and supports uh, supports a world without patriarchy, without hierarchy? Um, what does it mean to be able to um, fill the space that you need to fill while you're filling it, while also making room for other people to fill the space that they need to fill? Um, and how can I, from from the position that I have, whatever position that is, I mean, right now I happen to have a position, a title that sounds like I have some sort of um, whatever, some sort of authority. I don't. I don't have any real authority. I just have responsibility. That's the way that we built the organization. The you know people before me even in the organization I work for uh, built, designed the organization to uh, make titles have responsibility rather than authority. But um, but just having that title, sometimes people will be like, oh, you're executive director, so you're, you're somebody, right? Well, from that position, for as long as I hold it, I don't know how long that will be, um, I can continue to use that as a place where I can grab somebody else's hand and yank them up, and not just yank them up to my level, but actually, you know, use that momentum to get them higher get them into positions where their voices can be heard even better. Um, I'm not afraid of other people having um, a stronger voice than I have. Um, I just want to have my voice heard. Uh, and in the past, I felt like I had to really fight for that and I did those in ways that, as a man, could be extremely toxic. So, um, yeah, that one of the things that being a man and leaning into masculinity means for me is figuring out uh, how to live those roles. Um, another thing about being a man, to me, is um, is about strength, which is funny because one of the things about being a woman to me is about strength. I mean, women have the strength to give birth. I know I've done it three times. Um, and I've been a doula. I've helped other women give birth. So I, I know what that strength is. Um, I am not saying that womanhood is not strength, but what what is masculine strength? What is it good for? How do we use it in healthy, appropriate ways? Um, I look forward to leaning into learning that as much as I can at my great advanced age. I know I'm not going to have the strength of, you know, a 25 or 30 year old man who transitions, um, but this will still change my body and, and change my musculature, even at my age. And um, how, do I, how do I use my body appropriately, not as a threat, but as a, a source of nurturance? And we, in our culture, we tend to think of nurturance as being something that women do. But nurturance is definitely something that is deeply masculine. Think about images of, of a good father. A good father is a good nurturer, but also um, a good friend 
is a good nurturer as well? And what does masculine nurturance look like um, in comparison to feminine nurturance? I'm definitely looking forward to leaning into the exploration of that. This is a lot of what kind of man I would like to be. So I see that this is going really long and maybe I'm rambling a bit much. I hope not. But those are just some thoughts about masculinity, toxic masculinity and and the fight against toxic masculinity and um, and what it really means to be feminist no matter what your body is like. I hope you'll leave a comment and let me know what you think. Thanks.